Welcome to RWJ Barnabas Health's Health Talk Show. I am Dr. Douglas Oshinsky of RWJ Barnabas Health Medical Group. Diagnostic testing and imaging play an important role in modern medicine. Medical imaging refers to several different technologies used to view the human body in order to diagnose, monitor, or treat medical conditions. Each type of technology gives different information about the area of the body being studied or treated, possible disease or injury, or effectiveness of medical treatment. On today's show, we will learn more about the new cardiac diagnostic testing imaging, how it works, and who can benefit from it. We are pleased to welcome Dr. Sabahat Bakari, Director of Advanced Cardiovascular Imaging at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and leader of the Cardiac PET-CT program for RWJ Barnabas Health. He also leads the RWJ UH and Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School's Cardiac Amyloidosis and Cardiomyopathy Center, the first center of its kind in New Jersey and one of the largest centers in the country. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Bakari, for being here. And uh, thank you for everything that you do over at uh, RWJ Barnabas Health. For the audience, can you tell us a little background about yourself, uh, way medical school and how you ended up at RWJ Barnabas Health? And so I did my uh, residency at uh, uh, Robert Wood Johnson uh, Med School in Medicine. And then I went uh, to do my fellowship at uh, Columbia University Medical Center in New York. Uh, after my fellowship, I stayed there as a faculty for 22 years. And um, I uh, joined uh, Robert Wood about two years ago uh, as, uh, uh, in, as a faculty in um, uh, cardiology. I've been in practice for 35 years. I've seen a lot of changes in medical imaging uh, in, uh, instruments and uh, sophistication. When I started, we barely had echocardiograms that were better than 2D. And uh, since that time, over the last 35 years, there's been importance in medical imaging. Can you tell us about the popular diagnostic tests that patients uh, receive and how important medical imaging is? So medical imaging has changed a lot in the last, I would say, decade. But I still remember doing echoes with M mode, with no pictures, just those tracings. And then we came to 2D and then um, Doppler and other stuff. So uh, with the uh, echocardiogram, echocardiogram is still a workhorse for cardiology, but there are a lot of other imaging modalities which uh, have been very helpful for cardiology. So to start with, just for screening purposes, doing even coronary artery calcium scores, which helps with the, uh, it's a simple test uh, and Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health System offers it uh, to all the patients. And uh, that's a good screening test to see if someone has atherosclerosis in their arteries of the heart. Then moving forward, doing coronary CT angiograms, which is also a functional test in which we can look at the blood flow uh, to the heart and see if there's any blockage in any arteries. And that has really uh, changed now, you know, that that's now considered as the first line um, diagnostic test for diagnosing patients with uh, obstructive coronary artery disease. And then uh, moving forward from there, then we have a lot of functional testing. And in functional testing, we have nuclear stress test, which in old days, people remember it as thallium stress test. So now we do those stress tests and inject an isotope and take pictures during stress and at rest and see if there is any decrease in the blood flow when the patient's heart is stressed. And, uh, but now we have a new uh, modality, which you know, uh, for last, I would say a decade, uh, a lot of people have been using that, which is called PET scan, cardiac PET scan. And that is a lot more sensitive and specific in diagnosing 
uh, blockage and also diagnosing ischemia, which is decreased blood flow to different regions of the heart. And um, uh, we, you know, have uh, started that program over here at Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health System uh, for cardiac PET. And then uh, the other one is cardiac MRI, which is also an excellent modality for looking at a lot of structural changes in the heart and also looking at uh, um, a lot of what we call tissue characterization. That means if someone has any uh, infiltrative disease in which there's deposition of proteins or other things in the myocardium. So that's very useful in diagnosing that. And uh, at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, now all the imaging, cardiovascular imaging, is being done by cardiologists. So since I joined for the last two years, we have shifted everything to cardiologists and we have multiple uh, cardiac imaging uh, uh, cardiologists uh, who work as a team and help with all these imaging modalities. When I started off, basically we had EKGs, which was a very non-invasive, non-specific test uh, when someone would come in and I'd look for specific things such as ST elevations, et cetera, on the EKG, or for things like left bundle branch block, left ventricular hypertrophy. We then moved over to uh, ultrasound. Nice thing about ultrasound, non-invasive, can be done right at the bedside. We, they do that, that you know, when people come into the emergency room, if we're concerned about something, they go to a cardiologist's office, uh, they've got the echocardiogram, it's very easy to do. Of course, it's only give, gonna give you a 2D or 3D image. The 3D image is much better now than they used to be, but it's only gonna give you a little bit of the, uh, of the picture. Uh, cardiologists then have the uh, nuclear stress tests. Again, as you had described, you take the person's a little piece of their blood, you attach uh, some type of uh, nuclear material, you give it back to them, you put them on the stress uh, uh, test, you get a picture of their heart under stress and after when they're resting. You then compare the images on the nuclear thing, on the nuclear screen to see whether there's areas of ischemia, meaning that while they're under stress, it's not receiving oxygen, but when it is uh, resting, it is receiving oxygen, basically telling you which part of the anatomy may be having a problem. Then we, years ago, we used to then go immediately over to the coronary catheterization. Well, again, sticking the uh, catheter into the groin or into the anterior cubital fossa, uh, threading it into the heart, uh, giving the injection of dye, getting a picture, and then making a determination. Uh, the nice thing is recently uh, at uh, RWJ, we've gotten the uh, CT coronary calcium score, much less invasive, gives us not the exact same pictures that you get with a uh, coronary catheterization, but can give us a good, less invasive, uh, uh, and it's a good screening test now. We're using it much more as a screening now for people who have high risk coronary disease. Uh, and then you, we go over to the more advanced, the uh, CAT scan and the PET scan. PET scan being the positron emission testing, the CAT scan being the old CAT scan. Uh, again, when I had started we, in medicine, we didn't have either. Now we've got this. It allows us to see more image more. As you had described, the uh, PET CT scan, we can see infiltrative disease in the heart. Again, when I started, if someone had something such as IHSS or amyloidosis, maybe we'd be able to determine that on the, la on the, long on the lateral axis on an echocardiogram and maybe make some decisions based on that. Now with this, with the uh, cardiac PET scan, CT scan, you can actually see what's going on and see what, uh, if, it, if it really is IHSS, see if it's cardiac amyloid, and make better determinations on what the patient's uh, got. So tell us more about this. Right, so for IHSS and for uh, uh, amyloidosis, uh, those MRI is an excellent test to diagnose both of these uh, uh, conditions. But uh, uh, with the MRI, you cannot really diagnose amyloidosis, but you can have a real good suspicion that patient might have um, uh, amyloidosis. For uh, uh, amyloidosis diagnosis, what we use is a spec scan and we use a PYP scan. And I developed that non-invasive method for diagnosing amyloidosis. Uh, in 2013, and now it's been used worldwide how to diagnose amyloidosis non-invasively. Prior to that, the only way we could diagnose amyloidosis was with endomyocardial biopsy. Uh, if we uh, For cardiac PET scan, the benefit of cardiac PET-CT is that 
uh, you can look at both. You can look at the functional and you can also look at the anatomy if you want to do hybrid imaging with coronary CT with PET. But if you want to just do the PET CT for PET imaging, functional imaging, it's a much better test than the regular nuclear stress test, which is done with the SPECT imaging. The reason for that is because the resolution is much better with PET. The energy of the isotopes which we use is 511 keV compared to with the SPECT tracer, which we use is 140 keV. So the sensitivity is over 95%, specificity is over 95% in diagnosing ischemia. The other good thing with PET scan is that we can diagnose my microvascular disease. Non-invasively, there is no other method with, with which we could diagnose microvascular disease, which is very common in women who come with chest pain and in diabetic patients and hypertensive patients in which they have typical chest pain and you do their angiograms, they don't have any obstructive disease, but their symptoms are coming from microvascular disease, which we can diagnose with PET. And with PET, we can also diagnose coronary spasms. Again, common in women who come in with chest pain, and if you do the cath, you say, oh, you don't have a heart disease, but this could all be because of spasms. So with a cardiac PET scan, we can uh, the, uh, diagnose not only microvascular disease, coronary spasms, and also the PET scan, the whole test, lasts about 20 minutes, rest and stress images. As compared to a SPEC scan, which was the nuclear, regular nuclear test, which lasts about three hours. So much better test, gives us a lot more information and a shorter uh, uh, protocol and also significantly less radiation. The whole test radiation exposure is about three millisieverts which is just to give you a perspective that living in New Jersey, you get close to four millisievert per year as a background radiation. So it's really minimal radiation and compare that to a regular nuclear test, it's a nuclear test is about 12 millisieverts. So this is about three millisievert radiation. So less radiation, better test and gives us a lot more information with PET scan. Which is good to hear. Again, the vasospasm is again, another important uh, aspect of it, especially in women. You know, for many years, women been, who had the chest pain, they've sent, been sent for the coronary angiogram, comes back negative, and everyone says, okay, there's nothing really wrong cardiac-wise, and they're still having the chest pain. Now we've got this test that allows us to see the vasospasm or the micro disease, which means we can treat it more appropriately. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it really makes us a, a better uh, a better facility for these women who have the vasospasm to come to. They're not being poo-pooed and saying it's nothing. There actually is something there. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so the biggest problem is with women, their um, angina is also not typical angina like what men get. So sometimes they have chest pain. They are coming to physicians multiple times with the same symptoms, coming to the emergency room. You do the catheterization or you do the coronary CT angiogram, tell them you don't have heart disease. They say these are all, uh, you know, uh, symptoms uh, which are not coming from the heart. But when you do their PET scan, you see their significant microvascular disease. Then you can treat these patients. And basically, their symptoms improve by treatment of microvascular disease. Again, most of the blood flow in the heart is through the blood vessels, which are less than 400 micrometer, which is a mesh of small blood vessels. <clears throat> and we are only looking at about 10% of the blood flow when we are doing a coronary angiogram and coronary CT angiogram. So there's a lot of blood flow which goes through the blood vessels, which are less than 400 micrometers, which is your arterioles, capillaries, and all the other blood vessels. So, so which patients uh, should I send to you to uh, look at uh... A, a, pet, a, a cardiac PET CT scan? So I would say if you are considering a patient for detection of ischemia, a male patient or a female patient, again, this is a better test because the sensitivity and specificity for even diagnosing ischemia is over 95%. Compare that with SPEC scan, which is a regular nuclear scan, is about 70% sensitivity. So just for diagnosing ischemia is a better test. Second, if you have a patient who is a female patient who has this atypical uh, chest pain or has chest pain, typical angina, in those patients doing this test and asking to do 
uh, you know, give the give you the results of uh, their blood flow uh, at rest and stress, which would assess the microvasculature and also endothelial dysfunction and would also uh, give you uh, if the patient is having coronary spasms. So female patients or any patients in which you are considering a stress test, PET would be a good test. The other patients on which PET would be really excellent, which is considered a gold standard, is patients who have had a heart attack. And you want to see if the region where they had a heart attack, if that region has enough alive cells in there. That means if it's viable, that region, where the revascularization in that region would help improve the function of the heart. So PET is a gold standard for detecting viability for that region. The other patients who have focal myocarditis, sarcoidosis, PET is gold standard for diagnosing these conditions. PET is a gold standard for diagnosing device infections, for pacemaker uh, infections, for valve infections, for endocarditis. So all these things are excellent indications for sending your patients for a PET scan. So the good news is that since this is part of RWJ uh, Barnabas Health, most of our cardiologists that are part of that also now have access to this. Exactly. Yeah. Before that, you know, uh, there was really in, in, in whole of the health system, we did not have the PET scan, but now we can offer all these, uh, uh, you know, modalities for PET scan and also for cardiac MRI for all our, uh, you know, colleagues uh, who are um, uh, primary care, uh, internal medicine and cardiologists. So being part of RWJ Barnabas Health, a cardiologist has access to something that may not be available in other uh, areas of New Jersey. That's correct. Yep. So there are only two uh, uh, cardiac pet uh, right now uh, centers or cardiac pet facilities available in New Jersey. And one is at Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health. Are there any side effects to the cardiac pet uh, CT scanning? There are really no side effects. The only one thing is that uh, we cannot exercise patients when we are doing a cardiac PET study. And for those patients, we do a pharmacologic stress. That means we give them an injection which stresses the heart and we take the pictures. So if you want to get uh, information about how the patient is doing on a treadmill, uh, and those patients still uh, doing a nuclear spec study would be preferred. But if you are looking for all the other indications which we just discussed, PET would be a better uh, test. The, uh, like I mentioned, the other, always the concern with nuclear uh, tests is radiation. But with PET, the radiation is minimal. So much better test than other tests. Now, when they uh, go for a cardiac PET CT scan, is it in the same type of room that a CAT scan is in? Uh, it's a uh, it's different room. It's this uh, a room where they have a PET CT scanner, uh, and uh, right now we have it at Somerset Medical Center where they do it. And um, it's uh, uh, you know it's a similar kind of a machine. It's not like an MRI, so it's an open machine. So people don't get really claustrophobic in that. It's not like a tunnel they're going in. It's an open machine, and the whole test duration is twenty minutes. And uh, no knocking, no no like in an MRI machine. No, nothing. No loud sounds, nothing like that. Yeah. Which a lot of people really are very upset when they go in for an MRI, the bang, 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 as well as That's being true. claustrophobic when they're in there. That's true, yeah. So nothing like that. It's an open machine and no sounds. Now tell us a little bit about your leadership at RWJ University Hospital and Rutgers or Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at the, for, about the uh, Cardiac Amyloidosis and Cardiomyopathy Center. Right, so uh, we started the first uh, center uh, uh, for cardiac amyloid center in New Jersey in November of uh, 2022. And uh, we now have uh, close to 600 patients in our center, which is about third or fourth largest uh, in the country for the number of amyloid patients. Prior to that, the patients who had this disease had to either travel to New York or to um, uh, Philadelphia for treatment. But now we can offer that uh, in New Jersey. And we have about one third of our patients come from out of state uh, over here uh, for treatment uh, to the amyloid center. So uh, it, amyloid is a, a rare disease. And uh, in amyloidosis, there's a deposition of protein 
uh, in the di in different organs of the body, most commonly heart, nervous system, and musculoskeletal system and GI system, and patients uh, uh, present with the uh, you know a uh, lot of uh, 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 heart failure symptoms and other symptoms, and they have uh, it causes significant morbidity. And uh, uh, so the two most common amyloidosis in United States are AL amyloidosis, which is called light chain amyloidosis. And the other one is ATTR amyloidosis, which is called transthyretin amyloidosis. About 95% of all amyloidosis are either one of these two. AL is rare, but it's a, uh, considered a medical emergency. Once the heart is involved with AL amyloidosis, if untreated, Median survival is six months. And uh, uh, so we are really aggressive in diagnosing these patients and starting their treatment as soon as possible. And for our amyloid center, we work as a team. But we have uh, uh, hematologists, we have neurologists because it involves, uh, it causes peripheral neuropathy and autonomic neuropathy. And we have also the pathologist, uh, and uh, we work with the uh, geneticist. So all this is a whole teamwork, and uh, uh, we provide excellent care in, uh, to the patients who have amyloidosis. So how do you envision the cardiac PET uh, CT being used in the future? So cardiac PET CT, uh, there are a lot of ways which we can diagnose some of the patients with amyloidosis with cardiac PET CT. Uh, so these are all right now research uh, uh, tools because it's, uh, those isotopes with which we are diagnosing uh, amyloidosis with PET CT are not FDA approved yet. But uh, uh, so there's a lot of work being done uh, with a lot of research on uh, these isotopes, not only for uh, diagnosis, but also for treatment, because we are labeling these isotopes with uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies and with the uh, macrophages, which are going to the region where amyloid is and taking the amyloid out of those organs. So a lot of work being done. So, uh, and uh, you know, so we are lucky now we have a PET scanner at Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health System. So we can uh, uh, do all these research studies over here. How does this imaging help the patient itself? So uh, first is uh, uh, non-invasively diagnosing these patients with imaging. Like I said, without the imaging, the only way you could diagnose these patients was by taking a biopsy of the heart, which is an invasive procedure. So with this, you can non-invasively diagnose and also non-invasively monitor the progression of disease or response to treatment for these patients. So, uh, and uh, which is very helpful because the reason is if the patient stops responding to treatment, uh, you know, you need to give them some other treatment. Uh, otherwise, the problem with this disease currently is that all the treatments which are available work the best if we start it in early disease. And also their main role is stopping the progression of the disease. So if uh, uh, with this imaging modalities, we can really see if their disease is progressing and if we add, uh, need to add other medications to control their disease. And cardiac amyloid is known as the mysterious disease. Why is it known as the mysterious disease? Right, so it's a great uh, masquerader. And the reason is uh, because it, it involves multiple systems. And I, uh, you know, I would say that this is the most misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed disease. Sometimes it's taking them two and a half years since the onset of symptoms until they are diagnosed. And on average, they see three to five physicians before the diagnosis is made uh, because it involves the cardiovascular system, nervous system, GI, musculoskeletal. The most common presentation it starts with is carpal tunnel. And the carpal tunnel uh, precedes all the other involvement, especially the cardiac involvement on an average by six years. So these patients are going to multiple doctors and uh, you know getting different diagnoses and uh, so that's why it's uh, really called uh, mysterious disease or um, uh, difficult to diagnose disease. It's a very difficult disease to diagnose as a primary care. And usually we end up uh, diagnosing it as a uh, diagnosis of exclusion. We've excluded everything else. 
and then we end up sending them either to the rheumatologist or if they've got the cardiac involvement, to the cardiologist who puts his thinking cap on and says, you know what, maybe this is cardiac amyloid after he thinks about the cardiac disease, the peripheral vascular disease, the neurologic disease, then they're able to put it all together. And as you had said, up until Reese, up until a point, it used to be an endocardial, endomyocardial biopsy, which no one really wants to do if they don't have to do that. That's correct, yeah. You don't want to do an invasive procedure if you can avoid it. Uh, and for this, uh, uh, the reason I think uh, the biggest problem uh, with this disease, like I said, is the multiple system involvement. And I tell all my uh, cardiology colleagues that for cardiologists, we need to put an internist hat when we are seeing these patients. The reason is because it's multi-system involvement and we all, you know, try, uh, we are all practicing in our own boxes. As right? cardiology is only looking at cardiology. Other, so with this disease, I think really the internists are the ones who sh should be diagnosing this disease because of the multi-system involvement. And we need to increase awareness about this disease among internists and also among cardiologists. There are really uh, lots of patients who need help and who have not been diagnosed with this disease. And what, if they are diagnosed, there are different treatment options? So uh, before 2019, there was no FDA-approved medication for this uh, disease. And so that's why, you know, uh, it was really hard treating these patients. So now since 2019, we have five medications which are FDA approved for treating cardiomyopathy or neuropathy. And every year we are getting one to two new medications getting approved with excellent benefits for mortality and morbidity in these patients. And with the help of these medications, these patients' quality of life has improved significantly and they're living a much better life than the ones who were not treated prior to 2019. Any last uh, thoughts for the audience? So for um, amyloidosis, I think the most important thing is awareness about the disease. And also knowing that uh, in New Jersey now, uh, you know, we have a, a amyloid center with the whole team and uh, we are there to help you. If you have questions, we have a lot of education material. We do at least two, three seminars per year for amyloidosis for patients and for providers. So we'll be more than happy to help. So any, any, any questions, anything you need about amyloidosis, we are here to help. For cardiac PET scan, uh, for all the cardiologists, for all the uh, primary providers, you know, we have this facility available at Robert Wood Johnson. And, uh, uh, you know, which, as I mentioned before, that uh, it has multiple uh, benefits as compared to other modalities. And uh, we usually, uh, anyone who calls, we get the patient in within two weeks. A cardiologist who's affiliated with RWJ Barnabas Health, it's actually quite important nowadays now that they have the advantage of being able to uh, have access to the cardiac PET CT scan, which uh, isn't available at most other facilities. They also have the ability of people like you, who at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School run this cardiac amyloid and cardiomyopathy center, which is one of the largest centers in the country, and only one of and only one of them in New Jersey. So, you've got this terrific uh, uh, institute with all of its uh, integrated processes at your fingertips locally. You don't have to travel across the country. You're right here. You get the diagnosis, the treatment right here, follow-up right here. This, that's true, yeah. And we, we have, like I said, one-third of our patients who have amyloidosis are coming out of state. So this is a facility which really can provide uh, all the help you need for amyloidosis. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do at uh, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson uh, Medical School, at the uh, Cardiac Amyloid and uh, Cardiomyopathy Center. And thank you for everything you did in helping to lead uh, the bringing the uh, cardiac PET scan CT machine to our facility. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. That concludes today's episode of Health Talk. Please remember that the opinions expressed here today by our medical experts are not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. 
If you need a physician, please call 844-724-7123. For more information about RWJ Barnabas Health, Heart and Vascular Services, please visit www.rwjbh.org forward slash heart.